Hi, hello, welcome to a physionic study analysis. This is going to be my second to last study analysis for the topic of sucralose and its effect on insulin sensitivity. Uh, if you've been following physionic for a while, you know that I've been reading a ton of different studies on sucralose, trying to figure out if it has an effect at pushing us closer towards diabetes. Uh, unfortunately, this has been an extremely confusing investigation because what I thought was going to be extremely simple investigation turned out to be uh, anything but. But uh, something else I also changed recently is to start incorporating multiple studies in one study analysis. So that's what we're going to be doing starting today. And in this video we're going to be going over five studies that I've analyzed from front to back and we'll hopefully get a, a, a leap in the information that we know on sucralose and insulin sensitivity. And then in the next video, we're going to uh, cover the remaining studies that I've read as well, uh, along with, of course, the ones that I've already covered up to this point. Anyway, uh, so we're going to go over five studies. We're going to go over a series of different topics, stratify things based off of people's characteristics, if your normal weight by BMI standards overweight, uh, I have some information for diabetics, and uh, looking at some other metrics as well. If you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD uh, candidate in molecular medicine, and this is what I do. I do study analysis. This is what uh, my bread and butter and my passion. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, jump into this. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be going over sucralose on insulin sensitivity. That's kind of the big overarching theme and its effect in normal weight individuals. And that's really just based off of BMI standards, which I'm well aware of people's feelings about BMI, how it isn't necessarily indicative of body composition, whatnot, completely agree. But for the general population, it tends to be pretty accurate. Um, even if there are plenty of outliers. As a matter of fact, I am one of those outliers. I would be considered overweight by BMI standards. Uh, another one we're gonna go over is to, so I broke this up into two different segments and I've actually have more to discuss on this topic as well. Uh, not just based off of weight, but also looking at uh, a number of other factors, but I'll get to that. Uh, sucralose on insulin sensitivity in overweight individuals and then if you're part of my Physionic Insiders, you'll get access to this full study analysis where we'll also go over insulin sensitivity for diabetic individuals, as well as the effect that sucralose has on pancreatic function. So a few studies looked at pancreatic function as well. So if you're interested in accessing this full uh, study analysis, including the insiders, then, uh, then just hop on over to my Physionic Insiders and you'll get access to the whole thing, plus all my other study analyses and uh, much, much more, including a seminar where I'm going to be putting even more information together and packaging it nicely so that you have some uh, applicable takeaways. But if you're just interested in these two topics, then let's go ahead and move on forward. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be going over five different studies, which is, uh, which is certainly more ambitious than what I usually do. I do one study at a time. So I've had to organize things a little bit differently because I'm going to be showing you pieces of data from each one of these studies. But to follow along uh, with each one of these studies, we have to have some sort of marker. So that's what I've created here. So this, this is study 82. The reason why it's 82 is because now that I've been uh, categorizing my studies based off of the number, so I've read 80 studies. Uh, technically, I've read hundreds of studies. But at this point, since I started implementing this categorization process, uh, this is study 82 since that point. So study 82, 84, 85, 87, and 89. So we've got 82, 84, 85, 87, and 89. And so you're going to see these uh, little bubbles with the, the letter and the number. And then you'll know, okay, this is coming from this study. And I'll give, I'll give you some of the distinguishing features as we go throughout. Oh, and I suppose I should mention, I've got my notes here. Uh, all of these studies, 
since this is something new that I'm also doing is indicating the funding for these because uh, I realize that sometimes people feel like funding is of the utmost importance and it can be important, but, uh, <laughs> well, I won't go into it. But the point is, every one of these studies was publicly funded and there were no conflicts of interest. So in terms of influence from out like a, like a pharmaceutical industry or the nutrition industry, there's no influence whatsoever. Okay, study 84. Uh, I'm going to be starting with 84. I'm not going to go into as much detail with 82 for a very specific reason that I'll get into later on. But uh, I wanted to walk through each one of these studies through a kind of a small representation of what these uh, researchers did. So they recruited 17 overweight but metabolically healthy 35-year-old women. And then they separated them out into consuming water only, which is the control condition, or sucralose at, f so 48 milligrams, so t 2 millimole is the actual concentration. So 48 milligrams, which is equivalent to about one diet soda. So just, uh, just as kind of real world reference. Then they consume this, whatever it is, the control, so water or the sucralose, you know, just one quick take, and then 10, 15 minutes later, they have their insulin sensitivity tested. Now, for most of these studies, what they do is they do an oral glucose tolerance test, which, what does that mean? It means that they consume, let's say, sucralose, right, down it, and then about 10, 15 minutes later, the, the researchers will have them consume 75 grams of glucose, which is sugar, and then, so then they consume that, and then the researchers measure in the bloodstream what happens to their blood sugar levels as well as their insulin levels. So, of course, if they consume glucose, they're going to see an increase in that blood sugar because it has to go into the bloodstream and then be disposed of as it goes into the peripheral cells. And then, of course, to do that, you have to have the addition of insulin. So that's how it typically happens. That's how most of these studies, I'm going to point out uh, one or two instances where that's not the case. But for most of the studies, that's the experiment that they ended up doing. And that's how they're able to then measure insulin sensitivity because they're able to measure the effect that sucralose has on blood sugar. Is there more blood sugar? Is there lower blood sugar? Is there more insulin or less insulin? And then they're able to calculate the insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. So these individuals consumed, let's say, sucralose. Then they measured their insulin sensitivity. Then they would leave the lab for a number of days, go back to their regular diets, whatnot. Uh, so I guess the what's called the washout period is around three days to about a week. And then they come back into the lab. And if they were in the sucralose condition, then they repeat the entire experiment with water only. So what you'll notice is that this is only a one-time exposure. So what we're tr determining here is what does one-time exposure to sucralose do to the body? Do we see uh, changes in insulin sensitivity? So this is study 84. So keep these characteristics in mind, 17 overweight, healthy individuals, 35-year-old uh, women. And another thing I should add is that Almost, well, all of these studies included people that were naive to non-nutritive sweeteners, meaning that they consume less than they consume less than one time a week of non-nutritive sweeteners. If that's aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, whatever it might be, they eliminated people that continuously consume, let's say, diet coke or they use Splenda in their coffee or whatever it might be, they eliminated those people. So this is only in naive individuals or relatively naive. I mean, consuming less than once a week. Okay, so study 85, uh, they had two different groups of people. They had uh, normal weight, again, uh, quote unquote, by BMI standards and overweight. So these people had a BMI, I think of over 30. So they were in the obese category. They were metabolically healthy, however, in their late 20s, and they're predominantly women. So there were some men included, but I think it was skewed like 75% or something like that ended up being uh, women. Yeah, it was probably even more than that. Only uh, three and one men in each group, so normal and, and overweight. 
And then what they did is they broke them up into the water only condition. So same exact as the other study, uh, the sucralose, the same exact as the other study. And then they added a condition where they, they put sucralose in their mouth, swished it around for maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and then spat it out. So they did not actually consume it. Now, the reason why they do that is because there, there's good evidence that there are sweet taste receptors in our mouth that could have what's known as a cephalic insulin response, meaning that when we get exposed to anything sweet, that it leads to a reaction in our pancreas that leads to the, the release of insulin. And that is, does not necessitate that we actually consume the food so that we just get exposed to it. And even if we spit it out, we still see that uh, cephalic insulin re release. So this is at the same concentration as the amount that they actually consume. So they've got one where they actually consume the sucralose and one where they just swish it in their mouth. And then they measure insulin sensitivity. Same deal again. Again, these people then uh, end up comparing against one another. And we're going to see the, the statistical analysis between those as, as well. The next one uh, also included aspartame. So I'm not going to be covering the aspartame aspect. Uh, I'm going to be focusing far more on sucralose and water only. Uh, aspartame is a conversation for another time, and we certainly will be covering that uh, in the future as well. Okay, so this is in 19 overweight, diabetic, and non-diabetic. So if you're part of my insiders group, you'll uh, get the data on the diabetic individuals as well. And these people were uh, kind of middle-aged, in their 50s, and there was an equal proportion of men and women in this group. So again, consuming water only, sucralose, but here the sucralose concentration was lower. So it is 48 milligrams, but uh, it's in a much larger volume of water that they ended up consuming their sucralose. And then they en end up measuring uh, insulin sensitivity. That's uh, study 87. And then finally, study 89. I'm going to cover study 82 later on, but study 89 then had a comparison of water only. So we always have that control. And then they had a positive, what's known as a positive control on maltodextrin, which is essentially just a sugar. And so we should expect that there would be blood sugar uh, increases. And then the consumption of sucralose at two millimole, again, the same concentration as the other studies. They consume 40 milligrams, but they're also consuming in a smaller volume. And this is in eight normal weight, mid twenties, healthy, mostly women again. So this is what would be in the normal weight. Uh, there are few studies in normal weight individuals, but we're going to be covering this study. Now, one more thing that I should mention is that in study 87 and I believe study 89, they do not do an oral glucose tolerance test, meaning that all they're doing is they're just giving these people the water, the maltodextrin or the sucralose, and then they're just measuring their bloodstream just to see what happens. And of course, with the maltodextrin, you're going to see increases in blood sugar because, well, it is sugar and it has to go somewhere. It's not like your intestines can just ignore it. So uh, this is going to be a slightly different compared to the oral glucose tolerance test. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and, oh, one more thing. Uh, if you want to know more information on the study design and all that stuff, I have notes uh, so you can check out the notes and there you'll have the study design and inf more information on each one of these studies. Okay, now we can move on to the data. Okay, so we're going to start out by looking at normal weight individuals. and We're going to be looking at a variety of different measures. So as I mentioned, there's these bubbles to indicate which study we're talking about. So study 85 was the one where they did an oral glucose tolerance test. They have the sucralose ingestion condition. They have the sucralose uh, swish condition where they just put it in their mouth and then water. And all these, can, all these studies have the water condition. So uh, that should be relatively easy. So water obviously is, is going to be our control. Then in this one, study 89, this one, remember, I just went over, does not have an oral glucose tolerance test. So they just take the substance and then the researchers just measure their bloodstream. And the bluish, the light blue kind of greenish line is the sucralose condition. 
and the white dots, it's extremely difficult to see, but these white dots uh, are different timetables or different uh, time points that the researchers measure. So they measure, let's say, over 120 minutes, or they may measure over 300 minutes. Yeah, for this one, they measured over 300 minutes. So each one of those time points that they measure is indicated by a, a particular dot. And the, the open circles here is the water condition. Again, extremely difficult to see. It's not very clear. The bottom line is we're trying to see if there are differences. So do we see them superimposed on top of one another? Then there's probably no differences. But if we see one is lower or higher, then we can actually tell which one is higher or lower. And what we look at, what we see when looking at study 85 is in glucose, so this is measuring blood sugar levels. When they add the glucose, of course, there's a spike in glucose, and then it slowly starts to reduce back down as that glucose is then shuttled into the cells. And what we find is that there's no difference. Uh, sucralose seems to have no negative effect, positive effect, nothing. It just it's the exact same as if you were to just consume water. However, what's interesting is that when we look at the insulin levels, again, if you consume sugar, of course, you're gonna see an increase in insulin. Well, we see an increase in insulin with the water condition, and we also see it with sucralose, but the sucralose condition, sham fed and with the uh, regular consumption of sucralose, we see reduced insulin secretion uh, overall compared to the water condition. So reduced insulin, but the same amount of blood sugar. Now in study 89, again, no oral glucose tolerance test, these white boxes are indications of measurements for the maltodextrin, maltodextrin condition. So, and what we find is pretty simple to see is that we see increases in blood sugar with the maltodextrin, we see increases in insulin with the maltodextrin, but what we don't see is increases with sucralose or with aspartame. But as I mentioned, I'd like to focus on sucralose for this investigation. So sucralose does not change. So if you have fast, if you're fasting and you consume sucralose, there's no increase in insulin and there's no increase in blood sugar levels. All right, fair enough. But what if we look a little bit closer? So this is the exact same studies, but now we're looking at the actual quantification. So as opposed to looking to, at these graphs, we're actually seeing the actual numbers. And now we can actually get into, okay, well, what are the standard deviations? What are the standard error of the mean? What are the statistical analyses? Things of that nature. Uh, if you're not familiar with any of that stuff, that's okay. Uh, you can still actually at least see the numbers and see if there are differences. And they have to be pretty noticeable differences. So here they're measuring insulin, the insulin release. This is study 89, so the one without the oral glu glucose tolerance test. Well, I suppose I should explain these. This is a water condition. This is uh, sucralose with the swishing in the mouth, but no actual consumption. This is sucralose, so the consumption. This is maltodextrin. So I didn't show this in the graphic, but they do also have a swishing condition, uh, which is similar to uh, this this study, study 85, that's called the sham fed. So the swishing condition and the sham fed are the same, but obviously from two different studies. And here they're looking at insulin in the first 10 minutes. So after the, the consumption of these particular uh, substances, water, swishing, sucralose, maltodextrin, what happens to insulin within the first 10 minutes? Is there a rapid rise? Is there kind of a gradual rise? Is there no effect? And then GLP-1, which is a uh, which is glucagon, glucagon-like peptide, and glucagon-like peptide has a variety of different functions within the, the body. But one of its most commonly known is that when it increases, it can attach to the pancreas and lead to the secretion of insulin. Uh, so they also measured that. And then glucose and insulin, obviously. So glucose is the total amount of glucose that was secreted or that was uh, consumed by, I suppose I shouldn't say consume, but was absorbed, there we go, absorbed from the intestines into the bloodstream. And insulin is the total amount of insulin. So if we go back here, this would be the, everything under this curve right here would be called the area under the curve. So the total amount of uh, 
sugar that went up and then came back down. What, what was the total amount of sugar? And that's what we get measured here. So this one is only the first 10 minutes of insulin, and this is the total of insulin. Okay, so before I go into this one, which is very similar, uh, let's go ahead and look at this. So what we're looking for is differences against, technically they have uh, a particular measure or statistical analysis where they do only against maltodextrin. This is also a control, but this is what's known as a positive control. So they know, they expect maltodextrin to have certain effects and therefore they can predict those effects and therefore they can do the statistics or do the comparisons against what is known to happen. So I wish that they had done the statistics a little bit differently when it comes to the study because all their statistics were a comparison against maltodextrin and not a comparison against water. We're getting into more statistics here, but uh, generally if you compare multiple conditions against one, then you have less uncertainty in the statistics as opposed to if you compare multiple comparisons, there's a greater level of uncertainty that starts to occur. I'm not gonna go into the mathematics and whatnot. I really more so understand, me personally, understand more of the theory. You probably have to talk to a statistician to get a better understanding, but ultimately they just compared against one condition. Uh, still, it would have been great if they'd at least done, if they also reported the statistical analysis across all the conditions. So like. Uh, swishing sucralose versus sucralose would have been really cool to see, but they didn't. And what they found is that there's no statistical difference uh, versus maltodextrin. So 68 is the average, and then 24 is the standard deviation, so the amount of variation in the results. Now, of course, as usual, you might see like 68 and say, well, that's way lower than 235 from the swishing of sucralose, but the variation was presumably too high to be able to indicate a difference between the two. Also, it's possible that they didn't have enough individuals uh, to, in this study to actually detect a difference, which means that the study is then underpowered. Looking at GLP-1, uh, there were again no differences across these conditions. Again, you have to look, keep in consideration the, the standard deviation, the amount of variability. So it's 922 versus 658. 658 is obviously much lower, but still the, the variability is so high with 132 and 78 or 171 that there isn't enough statistical power there to be able to tease out a difference. That doesn't mean that there may not be a difference. It just means that we can't tease out a difference here. Now looking, now we start getting into the actual differences and that's looking at the total glucose. So the total glucose we do see, so there's no, there's presumably no difference between, and this is just an assumption on my end, but I think a pretty safe assumption. There's no difference between the water condition, the swishing of sucralose and the sucralose ingestion condition. However, there, all three of them were statistically lower in blood sugar levels compared to the maltodextrin condition. But that's not a shock, right? If you consume sugar, of course, your sugar levels are going to increase. And if you don't consume sugar, I mean, even if it's sucralose and it's supposed to be a substitute, people might think that you'd see an increase in sugar. But since you're not consuming anything, you're not consuming any sugar, how can there be an increase in sugar? So these stay really low and the maltodextrin increases uh, four or five fold. Then looking at insulin, again, we see uh, significant differences. So the, the general cha change was a decrease with the sucralose consumption. So we saw a decrease in, it wasn't statistic, it didn't actually show up here very well. So there's a slight uh, decrease in these conditions, well, especially in this one with insulin, but we see that there's a decrease in insulin with the swishing of sucralose and with the consumption of sucralose. However, we don't see much of a budging with uh, water consumption because why would there be uh, a, a change with water consumption? And then we see a huge increase with the maltodextrin. So again, it would have been so cool to actually see a comparison between these because there's a possibility, and I would say probably a strong possibility that you'd see a difference, especially if they had more people in the study but definitely against maltodextrin there is a difference. 
So this indicates, this data for study 89 indicates that there's no negative effect of sucralose on insulin sensitivity. Uh, not that they directly measure insulin sensitivity, but they do measure the proxies of like glucose plus insulin. And if you see a sudden huge spike in glucose, but you see uh, a, a, a almost no spike in insulin, then, you know, that would be detrimental. But if you see a huge spike in it, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. But Ultimately, the bottom line is I would say that this would indicate there's probably no effect on insulin sensitivity. That said, however, and then we could focus on study 85. And what we find here is that with across glucose, insulin, C-peptide, GIP, and even on these measures of the area under the curve uh, with glucose and insulin after 300 minutes, no differences. So, and if anything, glucose may have actually decreased a little bit, or at the very least didn't uh, change between these conditions. And that's when they swish the sucralose in their mouth, or if they actually consume the sucralose. And again, uh, also for insulin. So both of these studies would strongly indicate to me that there's no insulin sensitivity effect of sucralose. But... Another question that we should probably have is, do we have an effect if we look at people that are overweight? And in that scenario, things may be slightly different. So let's investigate. This is uh, study 84. So if I remind you real quick, study 84 is this one with uh, 17 overweight, metabolically healthy 35 year old women. They consume water, sucralose, you know, these are largely the same. Then we have study 85 and 87. So we have 85. So with the sucralose and the swish only sucralose. So that was the study that we just looked at as well. And then 87 is the one that also uh, has aspartame as one of its measures. But again, we're not as concerned with the aspartame. Okay, so let's begin with this top one. So study 84, this is again with the addition of the oral glucose tolerance test after they consume sucralose or they consume water at, they consume 48 milligrams of sucralose, which is equivalent to one diet drink. And what they found is that, as you can see, the water condition is this uh, kind of dotted line with uh, the, the non-filled in circle, the open circle, and the black circles are sucralose. What we find is that in measures of blood sugar over that time, that the sucralose condition has higher blood sugar. However, with insulin, we also see increases with sucralose. So this is really intriguing data, and we're gonna see a little bit more specifics on, with this study. So this would go against what the other studies showed. Remember with, especially with study 85, the addition of sucralose, there's no effect of sucralose, no uh, added effect of gluc with measures of glucose, but there was a reduction in insulin actually. So study 84 shows uh, something opposite. Then if we look at study 85, the same study as before, but we look at the overweight individuals, we find that glucose levels, again, this is with an oral glucose tolerance test, which is exactly the same as this study, we find that there's no difference between these conditions. So the sham fed, which is the, the, the sucralose sham fed with, that was the kind of bluish green, and then it's really tough to tell where the sucralose is in there, but it's extremely close, so there's no difference. So, yeah, so in this situation, we're seeing no difference with blood sugar levels. And then if we look at insulin levels, we see that the sham fed had a decrease in insulin levels. Okay, so that's pretty intriguing. But it seems like the, suc the actual ingestion of sucralose had similar uh, insulin levels to the water fed individuals. So this is pretty intriguing data because it's kind of antithetic to, to one another. And then study 87 is the one that included the aspartame condition. Unfortunately, I really hate it when researchers don't do this, don't do this, when they don't indicate 
uh, the differences between the conditions. But if you end up looking and reading into the, you know, the actual body of the study, they indicate the statistics between the different comparisons. And this, uh, this line right here is the aspartame condition, not that we're as interested in the aspartame condition. And the triangle condition, which is uh, this other dotted line, is the sucralose condition, and then the solid line is the water condition. Again, it's tough to see. I mean, even if you like zoom in with these studies, that's why I really wish that they would uh, show these things a little bit differently. But I understand that they have to show this over time. So this is one of the uh, only only ways to do it. And clearly, these are not as superimposed as uh, this study or even this study. It's kind of it's pretty close to one another. Here, it seems like things are kind of all over the place. So looking at blood sugar levels, looking at insulin levels. And although I was extremely skeptical, like extremely skeptical. I read this like three, four times because I was just like, I just, I don't know. It, it just does not look it, but I just, you know, you got to stick to to what the statistics show. And they found that there were no differences. This was not different from one another. So like this line was not different from this line in totality. Uh, the aspartame condition seems like it's way lower in insulin overall. And again, it was not different uh, compared to the sucralose, or at least the, su but we're interested in this uh, sucralose versus uh, water condition. No differences, unfortunately. So here we have these, and this was not with an oral glucose tolerance test. So that's also something to, to keep in mind. So these two were, this one was not. So pretty confusing results at this point because now we have studies that are indicating the opposite of what we saw earlier and some of them even on the same panel show or same slide show that they have opposite results okay so let's dive a little bit deeper let's look at actual measures of again looking at the the, the numerical values but also we have a measure of uh, insulin sensitivity with one of the the studies and so with study 85, this is what we saw earlier. So we saw the normal weight data earlier, and we found that there were no differences uh, across the board. Now, statistically speaking, there were differences between the overweight or obese individuals and the normal weight individuals. So if we were to compare just those two groups against one another, there are differences, but that's not a huge shock because if you are severely overweight, then of course your physiology is gonna be slightly altered by just that fact alone. But if we compare within the group, just looking at the overweight individuals compared against one another, we find that on measures of glucose, there's no differences. Measures of insulin, there's no differences. C-peptide, no differences. And GIP, again, no differences. But then when we look at the glucose condition, we find that the glucose condition is significantly higher than the water condition. So... And I think that applied, it wasn't in entirely clear uh, from the data or the, the way the researchers talked about it, but it seemed like probably both of these were significantly higher than the water condition. So if we look at this measure of glucose, we find that there's no difference. So the peak was no different, but the overall amount of blood sugar was higher with the sucralose condition. However, again, insulin was not different even though this is 1400 and this is 1195 again the 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 separation or the variation is is too great so that causes some uh some pretty interesting head scratchers at this point and you can hopefully get some understanding of why i've i've had extreme difficulty analyzing all these studies because things are just kind of going all over the place and trying to, to tease out those differences has been extremely difficult, but I'll speak to that a little bit more uh, later on, or just a, in just a little bit. Study 84 is one where they actually did an insulin sensitivity measure, so they actually calculated insulin sensitivity, and if so if it decreases, then that's worse. Uh, here we've got our p-values. They also measured the insulin clearance rate. I'm not as interested in that. That's more of a physiological measure that doesn't really indicate any sort of application, but... I can cover that as well.
So for insulin sensitivity, they're measuring the water against the sucralose condition. And they found that with sucralose, there was a reduction in insulin sensitivity. And what they also found is that the insulin clearance rate was reduced in the sucralose condition. What does that mean? That means that as the body, as the pancreas is secreting insulin, you have more insulin in the bloodstream. Okay, fine. So stimulation of glucose, there's nothing sinister about that. But then the actual removal of insulin from the body is reduced so that presumably you could have more insulin in the bloodstream. But do we actually find that? No. So it, the, the, the effect may be very mild. And again, it's possible that they just don't have enough individuals in these, um, under these conditions to be able to tease out these differences. So if the sucralose condition had 20 people maybe, or 30 people, then you'd have more data to compile together to actually be able to tease out some of these differences. And finally, I wanted to briefly introduce this study 82, which is a, a unique design in that they wanted to completely go past or get rid of the idea of, so we had studies where they sham fed sucralose, meaning that these individuals would put sucralose in their mouth, swish it around and then remove it and then uh, spit it back out. Now this study does the opposite. So they bypass the mouth and they deposit sucralose st straight into the stomach. So these are probably pretty uncomfortable studies, but what they did is they had these individuals, they had a, a, a tube shoved up their nose into their stomach and then the, the sucralose then obviously missed their uh, sweet taste receptors and deposited the sucralose straight into their stomach. Now they had four different conditions. They had a sucrose condition, so sugar. They had saline, which is uh, essentially just the vehicle, meaning that uh, it's just water almost. They had a low sucralose condition, which was uh, 0.4 millimolar and sucralose condition, which is four millimolar, which is uh, double the amount that was uh, used in some of the other studies. And what we find is, again, there's nothing sinister here. We just see increases in uh, blood sugar. We see increases in blood insulin, but only with the sugar. So if they bypass the mouth, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Sucralose still has zero effect or just about zero effect on blood sugar and has just about zero effect on plasma insulin. Again, I believe, I'm almost certain this was not oral glucose tolerance test. So this was just fasted. These people are fasted, they have this thing shoved into their nose and then they deposit the sucralose or sugar or water into their stomach and that's it. Uh, and they found no differences over several hours. So if this was interesting. Uh, you know, this is in, I think, normal weight, healthy individuals. Uh, I think maybe men and women as well. Nothing, uh, nothing too out of the ordinary here. Okay, so now I'd like to sit on this for a little bit. It's a really simple uh, image, obviously, but uh, there's a lot to say here. So most of the studies that we looked at, although the overall data, I get that even as I was going through it, and there's a lot more, uh, well, maybe not a lot more, but there's some more as well. Uh, some of it is really peripheral, like uh, the amount of sugar that the liver ended up spitting out over time and stuff like that, which I didn't feel was going to add anything to this overall sto story. But this is, this is a confusing set of experiments and studies. And I mean, the studies use perfectly normal experiments, but what we find is that there are differences in the reaction when the experiments are done almost the exact same between different studies. Uh, and generally, generally what we found is between these five studies is that four studies at least indicated that there was no negative effect of sucralose. Now, I'd like to quick touch on study 85 because when I came here, I did mention that blood sugar was increased and they ended up doing an insulin sensitivity test. I didn't uh, actually show it, which I should have, but they did an insulin sensitivity test and they found that insulin sensitivity was increased. 
as in it was better with the sucralose condition, not with the sham fed, but with the actual consumption of sucralose. So we've got conditions where things, there's no difference. We've got some where they slightly improve insulin sensitivity. So I'm just putting this under the overall umbrella of no negative effect. And then we found one study that did have a negative effect. Now, if you've been following me, my work for, for a while, you know that uh, I've covered two other studies on sucralose that have been more long-term. And the next video that I'm gonna be releasing is gonna be on more long-term effects of sucralose. So this one study, which was in overweight individuals that were metabolically healthy or generally relatively metabolically healthy, found that it did have a negative effect. However, these studies also had overweight individuals as well as normal weight individuals and found that there was no negative effect. So the the bulk of the data seems to indicate sucralose does not have a negative effect if you consume it uh, at, at that amount, you know, one Diet Coke's worth and one time exposure. However, one of the problems that I've been having is that there's, when we get into this next video uh, that looks at the long-term effects, we're going to see data that is just wildly out of, like all over the place. And I have a suspicion that scientists in general, including myself, are missing something. There's some piece of data, and I have one speculation as to why, uh, what that is, which I'll keep to myself for the time being. But it seems to me like there's we're, we're missing something to the point where we don't know what it is and we haven't been able to tease it out to then be able to select the appropriate samples out of the human population to actively test that hypothesis. Hopefully that makes sense. We just don't have enough information. Even with all these studies, not even just these five, there's more studies than these and I'm gonna be covering them. Uh, I've covered, I've read 14, 16, 17 studies on this <clears throat> and that confusion continues to stay. It seems to be ongoing. So limited to these five studies, this is the conclusion that we're coming to. Okay, so the conclusion based off of the five studies so far is that one-time consumption, one-time consumption of sucralose has more evidence indicating it is not harmful to insulin sensitivity in normal weight and overweight healthy individuals. And please go back one slide to uh, understand some of the caveats and just how skeptical I am, not, not of this conclusion, but that we need so much more information than, than what even these five studies can provide because we're scientists, researchers, including myself, we're missing something. We're missing something. But no doubt, it's not like we can just ignore the evidence. The evidence does seem to point based off of these studies that four of them indicated, yes, uh, no negative effect. And only one study showed that there was a negative effect. Okay. So if you're interested in learning uh, about sucralose and its effect in uh, diabetic individuals, as well as uh, sucralose on pancreatic function, so direct measures on pancreatic function, then uh, certainly hop on over to the Physionic Insiders. And uh, I realized that this may have been extremely confusing. Generally, I try to make things uh, a little more clear than I have. Uh, but unfortunately, that is extremely difficult to do in this case. So I apologize for the confusion. If there is any, please feel free to, to ask questions if you have any. And uh, hopefully we'll get to a little bit more of an answer in the next and final video of these study analyses for a long time on sucralose. Thanks for sticking it out if you made it to this point, And I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.